Welcome to Immigration Uncovered, the DACAWISE video podcast where we dive deep into the dynamic world of immigration law with the latest developments, practice management strategies, and the transformative impact of legal technology. I'm James Pittman. So here uh, for episode 20, the first episode of the new year, 2024, I have with me my friend Jim Hacking of Hacking Law Practice. He is a longtime immigration attorney uh, operating uh, in a couple of cities. Jim, you're in the, where, you're in, are you in St. Louis? St. Louis is headquarters. Then we have a satellite office in DC and one in San Diego. Great. So, I mean, before we get into, we're going to be talking about New Year's resolutions for 2024, and it's a kind of a fun topic. Uh, just discussing sort of aspirational things. We'll also be hitting some New Year's resolutions for immigrants themselves, uh, things that they should do to protect their immigration status, protect their families, maximize their chances of achieving permanent residency and, and citizenship. And uh, some resolutions, maybe uh, some pre prescriptive resolutions for the immigration agencies, things we'd like to see them change about. And that could be a very big topic, but we'll hit some of our greatest hits for things that we think they should do differently in the new year. Um, and hopefully they'll, they'll, they'll listen to it. Um, right. So Jim, before we do that, they just tell us, just give us a nutshell version about your practice. Sure. So, uh, we started the firm in 2008. So we're on year 16. We are a family based immigration law firm. Primarily we do all oh, probably 25, 30 H one B's a year and probably that many employment based things, but our bread and butter are uh, marriage-based cases, family-based cases, uh, counselor processing and adjustment. Um, we do a fair amount of asylum. And then uh, also I do a lot of suing USCIS and suing the State Department. So we're up to over 1,600 lawsuits that we have filed uh, for mandamus and APA action. Um, we also do litigate some erroneous decisions made by the agency. So it's a, it's a fun practice. That's great. I mean, we had uh, we had attorney Joe Gentilly, who also focuses on the federal litigation aspect on it. So it's something we've explored. And I think it's, again, it's something that's underutilized. It's a really important tool in the toolbox. Um, so I'm glad that you're you're focusing a lot. And you're actually the author of a book called Staying Here. Yeah. So that's a that's a little book that I wrote for international students. I think that these universities do a great job of recruiting international students. And I also think they make a lot of promises to international students. And I think once they get here, you know, sometimes like there's a little university up in Hannibal, Missouri, where Mark Twain is from. And we had these Brazilian soccer players playing in Hannibal and they look like deer in the headlights and they have sort of no clue as to what it's going to take if they want to stay in the United States. So I do these talks for international students, um, sort of at schools all around the country. And I sort of put it all into a book, all the best advice I have for people about how they can go from the F1 OPT route to H1B to green card and, and that whole thing. So that's what that's all about. Where, where is the book available? Oh, well, they, <laughs> uh, I need to update it. it. It is on Amazon, but, um, also we, we have a landing page for it, but it's broken at the moment. So I need to fix that. Oh, okay. All right. I'm sure you'll get it fixed. All right. Great. Um, yeah, I mean the student area, uh, that is, I, I feel like there's so many pitfalls for international students and, there's not that many attorneys really spending um, a ton of energy on really exploring the issues with international students. So I'm really glad that you're doing that because I think that's also really, really important work. But let's get into our, our topic for today, which is New Year's resolutions and Happy New Year, everybody, 2024. Um, so how should immigration practitioners resolve to do better in the new year? What they sh should they aspire to? Well, I mean, I had a couple that I came up with. Um, as conversation starters, and some of them were aimed at enhancing professional competence. Some of them were aimed at personal well-being. Um, the first one I, I came up with was pretty obvious. It's continuous learning, you know, that we should commit to ongoing professional developments by staying abreast of changes in the immigration law, policies, and precedents. And Jim, what are, what's your best advice for how to go about staying abreast of changes in the immigration field as a whole and in a person, in a practitioner's particular niche? I think um, to me, we are spoiled, those of us who are members of AILA, in that we get that great recent postings alert every day. I believe that if you dedicate 15 minutes, 20 minutes a day to just reviewing the things that come out, it, it's going to get you 90% of the way you need to be uh, updated on all the different changes in the law. Yeah, I agree. The AILA 8 newsletter is an excellent resource. Also, I'll make a plug for the DocketWise 
uh, newsletter, which is also a summary of immigration developments. So that's a really easy way to do it. Get on these newsletter subscriber list and just make it a habit every day. I mean, it's it's what you do every day that ultimately makes the big difference. So another resolution I had was consider specializing in a specific immigration area to deepen expertise and provide more focused and effective representation. Immigration, even though it's you know one area of the law, it's one federal statute, it really is extremely varied in the kind of practice environments and the kind of client populations that you're dealing with. It's actually multiple different subfields uh, together. So, um, you know, one of the trends is for practitioners to find a particular niche within that. Um, Jim, how did you go about finding, you know, your niche, your particular client demographic that you target? So, James, my wife is originally from Egypt. She moved to America when she was seven. We met on the first day of law school back in 1994. And um, in 1998, I became a Muslim in 99. Um, I, uh, we got married. And then whenever I would go to the mosque, people would ask me to help them with their immigration cases. And I thought, hmm, this is an opportunity. So I did sort of general litigation. I did maritime law for about eight or nine years. The Muslims kept asking me, Jim, can you help me with my citizenship case? Can you help me with this delayed case? And I would always say, well, I do barge work. And they'd be like, what the hell is a barge? And so um, I just sort of followed the request for help. And I thought in 2008, when we launched the firm, that we would do law for immigrants. So I thought we would do car accidents for immigrants, wills for immigrants, and then teach ourselves immigration. Well, within two or three years, it became pretty clear that the desire and the need was in immigration itself. So then in 12, 2012, we said, okay, just immigration. And every single time I've narrowed down, every time I've let go of practice areas, when I, you know, I, I would, I would, get, I wouldn't get these, you know, huge car accident cases. I'd get all the little car accident cases because I wasn't really good at it and <clears throat> I didn't know how to find those cases. And so I was spending all this time on a one-off car accident case that would ultimately pay me the same kind of legal fee for a pretty straightforward green card case or citizenship case. So it just became, it, it's not that I'm this brilliant guy. I just sort of paid attention to what people were asking me to do. But every single time, James, that I've narrowed down the focus of the firm we have improved our systems. We have gotten better at what we do. We've um, eliminated a lot of mistakes and we've made more money. So um, in 2016, 17, we stopped taking on deportation because nobody in the office really liked working on deportation. It was really, really stressful. And so when we let go that part of the process and when we started referring that to people who specialize in deportation, they started sending us some cases and we got to let go of something that was causing a whole lot of stress for a lot of us. Yeah, I mean, it's so important. Um, the, 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 the client population you're going to be dealing with, I mean, one, I think you should consider all factors when you're deciding on the particular niche. I mean, it's great to hear how for you it really developed organically from your circumstances. I think that's a really strong way to go. If you have an organic connection to a particular community and you can kind of suss out what their their immigration needs are and focus in on that where you already have that connection. That's a great starting point. You want to consider like geographically where you are, what are the the particular uh, communities that exist uh, in the area where you're planning the practice. I mean, if you are miles and miles away, you're like four hours from the nearest immigration court, you know, you may not want to be taking one to 10 cases because logistically it's going to be very, very hard to coordinate that. Um, so there's a lot of factors, and we have great content available in the other DockerWise podcasts and on our on our blog and website on how to you know determine what your niche should be and and what are the practical uh, steps that you should take to really focus in on that niche. So my next resolution was a huge one for us at DockerWise. That's technology integration. So resolve in 2024 to embrace and leverage technology to enhance your efficiency in case management. In legal research, we have a whole plethora of AI-related tools coming up, and client communication. Get involved in the legal tech-focused groups. For example, on Facebook, there's uh, some excellent group. There's Technology for Immigration Practitioners, just to name one. And follow uh, legal tech thought leaders on LinkedIn. There's some uh, people I can think of off the top of my head who are kind of thought leaders in immigration tech itself. I can mention some names of good friends, Jared Jascott, Nadine Heights, Greg Siskin, 
Ian Al- Almacy, Andrew Thrasher, Emily Vavrovsky from formerly. Again, not intended to be uh, a complete list by any means, just some off the top of my head names. Follow our podcast like you're listening to right now. Jim, how, what are you doing to stay abreast of technology and get the most out of your legal tech in 2024? So we've actually made the decision last year to build out our own processes in Salesforce. So we, we're leaving Pipedrive, which was our before unit, and Filevine, which is our operations unit, and we're doing it all in uh, Salesforce starting in about 10 days. So it's been, it's been a big process, but it's also been a great opportunity to really look at our systems. You know, I think whatever system you're using, you need to make sure that you're, you know, delegating things, you're automating things, that you're not um, doing things just because this is how we've always done things around here. I think trying to get off of paper, you know, we've been paperless since the first day we opened to the extent that you can be at USCIS. Um, But I really think that lawyers that don't embrace change are really going to suffer and not be able to keep up because I, I think the ABA has even talked about a duty of keeping up competency in technology. And I think, I think, you know, whatever you're doing right now is great. That's a good baseline. Try to do a little bit more, try to automate a little bit more, you know, big things, small things. I'm a big believer in Zapier and make, which allows you to connect one piece of software to another. So I think that I agree that following the, the legal tech experts is really good, but I'm also very practical. And I think that there's a lot of technology that people can use on a small scale to make their life or their practice easier. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and I mean, I want to just hit a couple of points. I mean, first of all, one of the things that we always tell people and bears repeating is try to get the most out of the technology that you already have. I mean, really look at what, what tools you already have. And are you actually familiar with all the features that they offer? Are you making the most of what you do have rather than getting nervous or wondering whether you need something else right away? Um, first, assess what you already have. Secondly, for us here at DocaWise, we are part of the Finipay MyCase family, and we are in 2024 going to continue deepening our integration with MyCase uh, and a whole lot of uh, you know interesting developments around that, allowing more and more DocaWise functionality to be used through MyCase. So uh, integration is definitely uh, the way that everything is going, um, and you know we really pride ourselves here just to toot our own horn on being very forward thinking in terms of making the most out of our integrations. Um, Next uh, point I had was mentorship. Resolution was mentorship. Seek or provide mentorship within the legal community to foster skills development and share experiences. Um, So Jim, how to to know when, how should someone know when they should seek a mentor? How should an experienced person know or go about becoming a mentor? What are your tips on that? Well, I think that the best opportunity is probably going to be with your local AILA chapter. And I think that when you develop those friendships of people who do the kinds of things you don't want to do, like I've become good friends with my deportation referral sources. I'm also, I also like to talk often to the people in town who sort of run clinics uh, that, um, you know, might do a fair amount of deportation. But I think that generally, if you, if you are deliberate about it, And if you think about what you have to offer, I think getting involved in your chapter, if you can do it on a small scale, you know, to me, I really like focusing on the CLEs. If there's presentations that we can do, or if, you know, we do, we do a lot of training here. So in our office right now, we have four lawyers who have been practicing maybe two years at the most. And so we, we do a lot of our training, um, you know, on like Wednesdays at lunchtime. And then we, but we've also then sort of perfected those trainings and, and presented them at local AILA chapter things too, because information is great and information is good, but a lot of people just really struggle on, especially, you know, a lot of immigration lawyers are sort of solos and so they don't really feel like they have a lot of people. So just put yourself out there. I think a lot of lawyers are introverts and a lot of lawyers just sort of have their head down and want to do the work. But when you, when you can help someone else sort of solve their problem or help them solve their client's problem, it's, it's, it's fulfilling. Absolutely. Absolutely. So important to, to give back. And I think one of the things that uh, always strikes me is that immigration lawyers are a very open community. Uh, 
seems to me that they're very much open to sharing knowledge, sharing information, and providing mentorship. Um, so it's uh, a receptive environment for if you need advice or if you're looking to uh, serve as a mentor. Well, my resolution number five is language proficiency. And this is something that I think a lot of immigration lawyers do have a good handle on, but I think it's there's always room for improvement. So a lot of times, you know, we'll deal with uh, non-English uh, speaking populations in the immigration law context. And uh, practitioners should strive to enhance their language proficiency relative to the client basis that they're serving to improve communication and understanding. And I had some suggestions. I mean, people either, I mean, a lot of immigration lawyers have an organic, that organic connection. Maybe they are from a particular uh, background. They may be immigrants themselves, or uh, like in your case, you have the connections to the community through your wife and so forth. Um, but some suggestions I had, if you're trying to get up to speed on a new language, uh, there are excellent apps. There's Duolingo, there's Babbel. There are nowadays a variety of private online tutoring services available for video lessons. I, you know, I've looked at uh, Preply. There's also Verbling, Italki, Verbal Planet, Wiseant, and others. Um, Jim, in your practice, what uh, foreign languages do you encounter and how do you make sure that you are able to effectively communicate with those clients? So St. Louis has a huge Bosnian refugee uh, community. We have about 70,000 Bosnians in, uh, in St. Louis, the biggest population outside of Bosnia because of the great work of the International Institute. And then, um, so we have two native Bosnian speakers here at the office, and then we have a whole team down in Argentina and some native Spanish speakers up here in St. Louis. So that's, those are really, and then Arabic, my wife handles a lot of that stuff. Um, so I took Russian for eight years, so I can understand the Bosnian piece, a good chunk, but I should, if I had more time, I would spend, spend it on Duolingo learning Arabic. All right, excellent. Um, all right, well, the next um, topic I had was client relationships, and my resolution number six was cultivate empathy and cultural competence. So this kind of ties into the last one, but we want to make sure that not only can we communicate orally and uh, in writing with our clients, but that we have the cultural competence and the empathy to to understand and serve clients from diverse backgrounds. So when you are dealing with uh, clients from, let's say, uh, other cultural backgrounds, what do you do in your office to ensure that you uh, that your office is culturally competent? That's a great question, James. And so, you know, I I stopped practicing law as far as handling cases maybe about two and a half years ago. So the time that I spend with people from foreign countries is I have this YouTube show where people can call and ask me immigration questions. Um, I go on for an hour, probably two or, two or three times a week. And so I get people with all different kinds of education levels, English levels, and of course, immigration situations. And I, I am 99% of the time very, very patient with people. Now, the people that watch the show regularly really get excited when I get mad. And I don't, I try not to get mad, but sometimes people just don't listen to me and then I do get mad. So when it comes to cultural competency, I think because I learned immigration law on my own, that I have learned how to explain it to people in plain language. When I first started practicing immigration law, you know, you'd have these immigration lawyers who could cite the exact provision of an INA statute based on just this fact pattern. Well, I had to put it in plain language. So I think I told you in the past, like we just called overseas cases an I-130 away or an I-130 here. So we so um, I think that being able to, going to law school is terrible for teaching you how to talk to regular people. So, so being in the practice of doing consults or like I do on the YouTube show, being able to talk to people at their level and their language and their level of understanding um, you know, you have to understand people come from places where the government is corrupt or the government will throw you in jail or or the government's just incompetent. And so being able to explain that to people in, in words that they understand is, is really, really hard. Yeah. And that actually feeds into my resolution, resolution number seven, which I have clear communication, which is uh, probably one of the most important things. Uh, but improve communication with clients by explaining the legal processes and expectations in clear and understandable terms this is exactly what you're saying. This is this flows flows out of the cultural competency too. So I have here my suggestion was to review your office templates and your website copy to make sure 
that you're setting expectations clearly and properly. Review your intake and follow-up processes. So Jim, in your in your office, now how do you, so you are um, kind of hands off as far as the actual management of the cases. So you are what, managing the overall practice and you have attorneys who are actually handling the cases, is that right? So I'm in charge of marketing and intake. Then my wife, she, my wife joined us in 2016 and she sort of oversees the lawyers. So we have about five pods, which are lawyers and paralegals handling cases. And she sort of oversees that. And um, how do you go about uh, setting client expectations? I mean, what, what steps are there uh, in, in the office to make sure that, you know, from the front end clients know, uh, uh, know what to expect as far as how to deal with the firm? So this is a great question, James. Um, I love to tell clients we're not going to take their case. I always tell clients exactly what I think the chances of success are. Uh, obviously, I'll have caveats in there, but I think it's super important, super important at the outset that if a client has a tough situation, a tough case, a case that might not get approved, I there is no way in hell that I'm going to promise them the moon and say, if you hire me, I will save you. I'd much, I want them, I always picture it this way, I want them sitting next to me I want them to understand exactly how hard their case is. I want them to understand all the pitfalls and the problems. I was on a call last night with a couple where they got one hell of a notice of intent to deny. And I, I one, wanted to put the fear of the Lord in them. And, and I did that last night. I thought there's no way in hell they were going to hire us because I said, look, even if we do our very best work, I think you got a 25% chance of winning this thing. I'd much rather do that. Then tell them, oh yeah, just you know, write me a check for seventy five hundred bucks, and I'm going to save your butt. Like that, that's just not how we do it. So, you know, that's a real big piece of it. The other one is, you know, because I have this YouTube channel, because I have the show, everyone wants Jim to be their lawyer. They want Mister Jim to be their lawyer. Well, I don't handle cases anymore, so we really have to do some education on why Jim does things that he does, and why you don't want Jim handling your cases. You want Jim's wife Amani handling your cases, and the other attorneys because they're in it every single day. And once we've set our expectations, we want to provide the best client experience and handle our cases efficiently. So this um, is kind of a part of what you're doing in your marketing function at your firm, educating clients on immigration processes, rights, and responsibilities. Um, so let's talk about um, what do you think of some of these suggestions? So some of the suggestions I had were a welcome packet. Uh, you know, uh, once retain, have a client is retained, you know, providing the clients with a comprehensive sort of packet that outlines the immigration process they're going through, key timelines, and an overview of their rights and responsibilities. Have you done anything like that in your practice? James, um, I'm ashamed to admit that this has been on my to-do list for almost four years. So this is, I think it's a great idea. We just haven't gotten around to it. Okay. How about client workshops? Um, you mentioned the work, a lot of the important work I've been doing with foreign students, but one of the ways to educate the client base is to organize seminars or workshops for clients to attend, either in person or nowadays online, where you explain the immigration processes, discuss common issues, and answer their questions in person. Have you done any, you've done Q&A uh, shows? Yeah, and we have a Facebook group with like 12,000 immigrants in there, but it's not client okay. specific. I do think, I do think, that's a good idea. And I think we could be doing more to love on our current clients. Yep. And um, how about videos, webinars, and online resources? Um, I mean, this we've kind of been talking about a little bit, but uh, do you are your videos pre-recorded or do you do live stream sessions as well? And are there other sort of besides sort of your um, regular show, are there other resources, video resources that clients can access at their convenience? And how do you break that down? Yeah. So um, I'm sort of undiagnosed ADHD and I had probably 1200 YouTube videos before somebody said to me, Hey Jim, you might want to organize those into playlists. So now if someone wants to see all my videos about, you know, a spouse case adjustment or about an asylum case, then the team sends them the intake, the uh, email with the links to those channel, those parts, those uh, playlists inside YouTube. One of the suggestions that I um, had was uh, really uh, including a comprehensive FAQ uh, section on your website, frequently asked questions. I mean, that is something which I think people are likely to turn to when they look at your website. Um, Jim, do you have an FAQ section on your website and what do you believe should be included in that type of section? 
So I think that if there's any lawyers who are having trouble with content and that FAQ should be the first thing that they do. So, so first thing is ask yourself 10 questions. What are the 10 questions I get asked the most about each case type or each, or even just our firm, if you're just starting out, then what are the 10 questions that people should be asking? And I think that if you do those two things, that's a great way to get started. And that'll be something really helpful for people on the website. It's also good content for search because if people are asking these questions of you, they're also asking that question of Google, right? So most of my content ideas come from client questions or potential client questions. I, I will make a YouTube video when someone asks me a question. If I know the answer, I'll just make a video about it and then send them that answer because I'd rather, you know, use that content over and over and let other people share in the knowledge that, that I have. And if I don't know the answer, I'll go look it up and then I'll make a video about what I learned when I went to look it up. So I think, I think that creating content can be really easy if you just follow what people ask. All right. Well, again, we're we're on the resolution of improving how to improve our client experience in 2024. And my next tip that I or suggestion I had was using role playing sessions to prepare for interviews or hearings. So, Jim, I know you're not hands on with the cases anymore, but maybe you can still speak to it. Did you use or do or does your office currently use role playing sessions to simulate, you know, common scenarios or help them understand what to expect during an uh, interview or hearing? Yes, we do that both for uh, any case in which there's going to be an interview at USCIS or at an embassy. The attorney, part of what they hire us to do, the attorney will prep the clients uh, for that interview and they'll act as if they are the USCIS officer or the consular official. And some of these we've even, we've even role played uh, in the office with team members acting as the lawyer, acting as the clients, and then my wife acts as the mean old USCIS officer. And we have filmed those and put those on YouTube. And number one, they're really funny. But number two, our team learned why it's so important to have a file well organized when you go to an interview because it's like this. And they were sort of surprised and shocked to see you know, how quickly you have to be able to grab a particular document. And so they really started to understand why it's so important to, to be organized. Absolutely. And, uh, being organized also leads into my, um, you know, kind of 10th, uh, sub aspiration, which is resolve to use an online client portal or online system for collecting documents and information from clients and for sharing documents and perhaps invoices with clients. So for example, at DocketWise, we have a client portal. That's a feature of our product where the user's clients, the attorney's clients can uh, upload documents, upload information, answer questionnaires, and also the attorney side can share documents, share invoices, et cetera, with the clients through the portal. So uh, Jim, um, in your office process, how, how far along have you gotten as far as being able to collect and receive and share all information or practically all information online? So I think that's one of the key features of DocketWise and one of the things that people really need to think about when it comes to efficiency and automation. Think how much time you spend going back and forth with clients. Hey, you got that birth certificate. Hey, you got that birth certificate. Hey, can you send me that birth certificate? You know, when you have a system where it's laid out clearly where people can upload their documents and everyone's on the same page as to whether it's there or not, it's just it's just a no brainer when it comes to to automation and making everybody's lives easier. Right. It's perhaps the biggest pain point in practicing immigration laws it is is traditionally was a very labor and time intensive process of collecting documents and information and and so forth. And uh, you know, kind of Minimizing that, eliminating the pain involved in that was kind of our, you know, talk of one of Doc Wise's main reasons for for existing. Um, okay, so I have my uh, next uh, sort of tip on maximizing client experience is uh, community outreach. And Jim, you talked a little bit about this engaging in community outreach to reach your potential clients and provide basic information about immigration processes and legal services. So. Talk to me about nowadays what your community outreach looks like. Are you still, you know, um, you know, giving uh, programs at the, you know, in the mosque or, or how does it work nowadays? If you talk to most marketing people, they're going to all want to talk about SEO and clicks and all that stuff. 
in, in social media. There's certainly a place for that. Very, very important. But there's also something to be said for meeting people where they are, to make it easier for them to find you, to make it memorable that you came. So in St. Louis, when I, when I first converted in St. Louis, we had two mosques. Now we have 18 or 19. So I'll actually go and give a talk about once a month at night to people where they, you know, there's a never ending supply of immigration questions. So, um, and I also, like I said, I do the talks with the international students. So it, th that's a really, really good long play because you, when you're there, you should be capturing people's contact information so that you can stay in contact with them. But I also invariably, whenever I do a, a talk, I almost always come away with at least one or two new cases right then. So it's a good long-term play, good short-term play, plus you're adding value, you're being seen as an advisor and an expert, and you're being able to show your expertise by being able to answer people's questions on the fly. Now, you might not feel so comfortable with that if you're sort of new in your practice, but that's why we go back to the very first thing that James said, which is spend 15 minutes a day educating yourself on this practice area that you're claiming that you're an expert at. My next sort of sub sub aspiration for client experience was storytelling. So I think that you get a lot of mileage out of uh, sharing success stories or case studies. And these can be done in your videos. These can be done with testimonials uh, and, and so forth. Jim, have you utilized the technique of storytelling in your in your marketing efforts? James, one time I made a video about sort of a, a an, an amalgam of clients into one person that I called Muhammad. And I made a video about Muhammad's story, which was that he'd been waiting for his visa to come to the United States for a really long time. And his wife hired us to file a lawsuit for him. And I had people emailing me saying, I'm Muhammad, I'm Muhammad, I'm Muhammad. Like, that's me, that's me. So I don't think there's anything more. I mean, having a lawyer talk about the nuances of immigration law, that's all well and good. But at the end of the day, it's the stories and the connection that are going to resonate with people when they say, hey, that's me or that's the woman for me or the man for me. That's the lawyer I need. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, my next sort of set of aspirations or New Year's resolutions um, have to do with um, personal well-being. So we've talked a lot now about your uh, practice competence. Now on to the lawyer's personal well-being and the well-being of their staff. Um, so some of mine, I'm going to sort of condense some of these so we can get to some of the other resolutions. Work-life balance, prioritize work-life balance to prevent burnout and maintain overall well-being. Again, I want to emphasize everything I'm saying here is not only for the attorney, but you need to make sure that if you have employees, you're also providing them the opportunity to have balance in their lives um, and avoid burnout. Mindfulness practice, incorporating mindfulness like meditation or yoga or just some quiet time every day to help you manage stress and stay focused. If you can have some quiet time, I personally find that having some quiet time every day where you simply sit by yourself uh, and uh, allow your sort of thoughts to go quiet, it allows you to then move back to your day after that with good mental focus. So that way things aren't, you know, you're not feeling overwhelmed by multiple things. You let everything quiet down and then go back in a focused manner and you're more efficient. Also healthy boundaries, establishing clear boundaries with clients to maintain a healthy and professional attorney client relationship. So this I think is also a big one for immigration lawyers, because I think that a lot of immigration lawyers are altruistic by nature and um, you want to help the clients. You want to go all out to help the clients, which is great. There's a duty of being a zealous advocate, but at the same time, it is a professional relationship and there must be certain boundaries, um, you know, to, uh, basically for things to remain a as they should. And also my last one, let me throw my last one in, which is self-care days, scheduling regular self-care days for you and your employees to recharge and, and foster a positive, uh, mental and emotional state and incorporate physical activity on a daily basis. So even here, even though I haven't practiced since I uh, became co-founder at DocketWise, we do have at our company now, uh, you know, days where uh, people are, t take personal time and uh, it's basically a kind of a well-being day. You take a well-being day and come back to your job much more energized and focused. So Jim, out of these uh, well-being uh, aspirations that I've given, which which have you found most valuable? And let's hear your thoughts. So um, I wake up in the morning, I go to the gym. When I get to the office, I then meditate and I journal. Those are all really helpful. During the day, I have a mat over there that I try to stretch on as well if I haven't stretched at the gym. 
Um, I go to therapy once a week. I have a coach, um, a mindset coach. And so, and I'm a big believer in all these things that you said. I think getting that blood flowing is really important. I think boundaries are really important. And I also think that mo some people will say, well, I don't have time to do all that stuff. Well, that's why you delegate. That's why you automate. That's why you use things like DocketWise to make your life easier. I suspect that most people listening to this are probably doing at least 20% of their time is being spent doing things they don't need to be doing, somebody else can do. And if you either automate that stuff or delegate that stuff or eliminate that stuff, then you're going to have time to take care of yourself because at the end of the day, this is a, a marathon. It's not a sprint. Absolutely. And like I always say, um, doing something is better than doing nothing. I mean, if you if you have a day where you have you know multiple meetings and, and so forth, then you really feel like, well... Uh, you know, you, you're not going to get in your, your physical exercise. It's better that you go and do 15 minutes than do nothing at all, really. Um, the continuity is very important. And you'd be surprised, um, you know, if you're efficient, what you can really get done in a short period of time. Um, again, if you don't have uh, 20 minutes to, you know, practice mindfulness, practice it for five. Um, so always better to do to do something and do it regularly and maintain the habit. It's it's in the it's in the accrual over the long term that these habits really make a difference for you. And also social connection, cultivate social connections and and cultivate social connections both within and and outside the legal community. Um, you know sometimes people in a in a in a structured profession like law, um, you know, can kind of they get to a point where they're so busy with their job and their family that the only people that they talk to are people within their profession. But I think as there's something to be said for maintaining social connections, even outside of law with non-lawyers and, um, you know, getting, continuing to stay in touch with, you know, people in, in various walks of life um, and have, have a social support system, um, you know, of, of different sorts of people who can provide you different sorts of you know, feedback. Now about, um, I want to talk about resolve to uh, do the best that you can in your professional relationships with other attorneys. And um, I have as uh, some of my aspirations here, foster collaboration with other legal professionals and other experts in the immigration space, as well as advocacy organizations. One thing you can do is review your LinkedIn profile and make the effort to reach out and connect with colleagues who might have valuable insights. Review your LinkedIn profile, review your connections on LinkedIn, who are you following, and uh, are you following people who are who are adding value and who might have important insights? Um, another aspiration I had was networking. Now, there's never enough time to attend all the events, all the conferences that we might want to attend. Um, so really choose the ones that give you the most bang for your buck. Plan it well in advance. I think one of the keys is planning it well in advance and commit to it. Um, also, community engagement, we talked a little bit about through pro bono work and outreach. Um, ethical practice, resolve to commit to having the most ethical practice you can. Review your ethical rules, ethical opinions, make sure you're getting the required number of CLE credits. And then the last aspiration that I'm going to give before getting Jim's thoughts is advocacy for change. So engage in advocacy for positive changes in immigration policies that will benefit your clients and benefit American society as a whole so that we can get the most out of immigration to the United States and work toward a fair and just immigration system. I don't need to tell anybody that 2024 is an extremely pivotal year it's an election year. It's a presidential election year. It's important for reasons that everyone already knows. And it's more important and, than ever to support reform initiatives and work toward electing candidates that reflect your concern for a fair immigration system. So Jim, out of those, please, let's have your thoughts on connecting with colleagues and making a difference in the system. I think those are all great suggestions that you had, James. The only one that I would add is when it comes to networking, um, sometimes we get a little too insular. And so meeting with, you, you said people in other professions, I think that's good, but I think specifically lawyers in other practice areas is good. Um, I think it's interesting to hear how other people run their firms, how other people, um, solve certain problems. And, you know, because a lot of the issues that we, that we encounter as law firm owners 
I mean, you can learn lessons from all different kinds of industries, but specifically from other law firm owners. And also there's that co collegiality aspect of, you know, we're all going through this together. We have a, a pod, I have a podcast with my friend Tyson. He's a personal injury lawyer. We've done it for seven years where it's called Maximum Lawyer. And it's just us talking about what it's like to run a law firm. So that's really how I connect to other law firm owners is through the podcast and, and everything that's grown out of that. Excellent. I'm definitely going to check out that podcast, Maximum Lawyer. Um, one last set I had before, we're going to move on in a second to resolutions for the immigrants themselves. Um, but one last set for practitioners I had was self-reflection and improvement and how to, how to go about improving in the new year. So a couple of things is in terms of goal setting, you want to set clear, measurable professional goals for the year and regularly assess your progress. So it is really not a stretch to say that you should plan out what you want to achieve, plan out your professional roadmap for 2024, what you want to achieve, uh, and set and break that down into quarterly or even monthly goals so that you can stay in touch with your progress. Uh, you know, you might have a, a goal of growing your, your practice by a certain amount by the end of 2020, 2024. Well, how is, does that translate into how much you need to do each quarter? That's, that's the key is breaking it down into smaller steps and staying in touch with your progress and, and, and establishing, uh, first of all, monitoring your progress, but also establishing a feedback mechanism. So very important in self-improvement is having feedback. You want to seek constructive input from your employees, your colleagues, and your clients. Um, and an important way of, of doing this is by surveying. You can have surveys of your employees. You know, how do you feel that we as a firm are doing on this measure, this measure, and this measure? What would you like to see us do differently? Same thing with the clients. You should definitely be surveying your clients, if not every single client whose case you finish, at least surveying clients periodically about how they found their experience and suss out, you know, suss out that feedback into, you know, what is, what, where do they have legitimate points of ways that your firm needs to improve? Um, very important. And learning from setbacks, which sounds, you know, kind of cliche, but it's super important. Embrace setbacks. Nobody gets it perfect the first time. Embrace setbacks as learning opportunities. Don't get discouraged, but rather take a step back, look at the situation objectively, and use that to refine your strategy and your approach to the problem. And don't forget to celebrate your achievements. That's super important as well. You have a lot that you want to accomplish. You don't want to get discouraged. You do want to celebrate your achievements. If you met your quarterly target for, let's say, your, your growth target in your firm, celebrate that you know, take the staff out for a pizza or whatever. Um, but acknowledge and celebrate your achievements, both big and small, to keep your outlook positive and maintain momentum. Jim, what do you think about these aspirations? I think those are all great. I also think so much at a time like this, we want to add all these things. I think you touched earlier a little bit on subtracting things. I, I read a great book by a professor at my son's school, University of Virginia, called, called Subtract. And it's all about doing less. And I think that sometimes the best thing we can do is to, to stop doing some things. Yeah, it's it's also an important thing to keep in mind. Um, sometimes it's better, especially if you're doing unnecessary things, much better to do a smaller set of things very effectively than try to do too much and do it not so well. That's, that's important as a general principle. And I think people get you know caught up in Focusing on achievement, focusing on quantity, we should really be focusing on quality of our improvements. All right, well, we're going to move to part two of our show today, which is New Year's resolutions for immigrants or clients of immigration lawyers. And what should they be aspire to do differently in 2024? So, Jim, um, what are your thoughts? I mean, some, some ones that I had off the top of my head. Um, stay informed. Uh, they should commit to staying informed about changes and how should they do that? How should they do that? So I think that, you know, learning from their, their attorneys is a good way, but I think, I think that most immigrants, when it comes to, to, uh, what they need to be thinking about is that they're always mad. The cases are taking too long. 
And I understand that. You know, I tell my team all the time, we're a logistics company. We're trying to get them from point A to point B. Point A is where they're at. Point B is where they want to go. I, t I explain this to clients too. You know, we want to get them from Cincinnati to Chicago or from green, la green card land to citizenship land, right? And so they, they get really frustrated with how long these things take. And I say, what you should do, instead of getting mad about that, think about how to make your case better. Think about how to get ready for the interview that you might have especially, you know, if it's citizenship, they clearly will have an interview. So spend your time reviewing what you submitted. Spend your time, um, spend your time, you know, reading over the questions. Have somebody read them to you. These questions are all in written form, but you're not going to have that writing in front of you when you go to your interview. So use this time wisely. And, and the other big thing that I tell people is stay off the goddamn um, alerts because half the time they're wrong. The online portal, Emma tells you things that aren't true. You know, people say, I'm at this, I'm at the California service center. Can I send my case to the Virginia service center? I'm like, dude, I've had cases that are at allegedly fast service centers go very slowly. I've had cases that are at allegedly slow service centers go very quickly. So I, I would tell them about some of those meditation tools and the mindset tools that we talked about earlier. To me, it's about how do I get through this process without being a crazy person? And so we spend a lot of time talking to them about that. There's all the information in the world is out there, but if, if their mind is going crazy and they can't rest at night, they're, they're not going to be any good to anybody. And then what would be your, your top tips in terms of what, what clients of immigration lawyers as a general proposition in your experience, what should they do, do differently or avoid, let's say, what should they avoid doing via V working with their immigration lawyer? Well, number one is don't view your immigration lawyer as your enemy view them as the person who's trying to help you out of the situation that you find yourself in. Do what you can to make their life easier. There will be down periods when the case is just simply pending. And we will try to keep you updated during those lulls in activity. But you have to understand at the outset that there's going to be a lot of activity at the beginning and a lot of activity at the end. And then there's going to be a whole lot of waiting in between. We'll do what we can on our end to make sure that that goes faster. But the time comes where we need to start bothering them to um, get your case moving. We have tools to do that, but you have to trust us to let us do our job. And you need to s spend your time focusing on living your life and trying to be as happy as you can. And and don't worry about the ups and downs of the momentary changes in your case online or in reality. Absolutely. It's, it's great advice. Some of the aspirations or resolutions I, I had uh, were uh, they could consider building a support network. So actively engaging with local support groups around that work on the issues of immigration or organizations uh, for immigrants um, to build a strong support network. That way they don't feel isolated in the journey that they're going through. Immigration is a journey. And like you just said, it has ups and downs. So it's really important to cushion the down times or the times when nothing is happening by staying, staying in touch with people. Um, be choosy about the information that you consume. Do not, uh, uh, let's say, uh, believe rumors. Do not be careful that you are getting information only from qualified sources, right? Um, also have regular check-ins with your immigration lawyer. And if you have a question, ask your attorney, don't stay stuck, don't stay mired in uncertainty. If you're stuck in uncertainty, uh, you're more vulnerable to kind of consuming, let's say, bad information or information that is unreliable. Also, maintain your documentation. Organize and maintain all of your relevant immigration documents in a structured way. Have a file where you've got everything organized. That way, um, you uh, it's much easier for you to provide necessary information when required. For example, Somebody gets a conditional green card. They know that two years later, they're going to have to file for removal of conditions. So have a file, maintain your joint bank account statements, your, your leases, your other documents, you know, for example, that you have with your spouse over the two years so that when the time comes to remove conditions, you just have all of that ready. You're not running around at the end of the two years trying to go get, you know, documents from years ago um, and keep all of your copies, including your electronic copies in safe places and safe virtual places. Make sure you password protect sensitive data. 
um, and also participating in community activities uh, can help immigrants to build connections, contribute to the community, and also showcase the positive impact uh, of immigrants on society that helps to uh, improve public perceptions. Jim, which of those resonate with you and what are your other tips for uh, how immigrants can uh, have in 2024 the best immigration journey possible? I think that you're right, that, that ultimately immigration can be a very, very lonely, the immigration process can be very, very lonely, especially if you're talking about trying to bring a family member who you miss and love to the United States, right? So that's a lot of our clients. And so I think finding places where you can talk, whether it's with a therapist or with friends or other people who are going through the process, that's one of the reasons why we started the Facebook group so that people could just sort of talk about what's going on emotionally when they're separated from their spouse or their children or whatever. And so I think that anything that they can do to keep positive and to know that this is temporary is time well spent. And I have some that are kind of resolutions for immigrants to stop doing things that won't help them. Um, one thing is to avoid procrastination. Don't procrastinate on your immigration-related tasks. I mean, if your attorneys asked you for information, get to it in a timely fashion. Timely action is crucial for maintaining your status and working with your, attor with your attorney in a smooth and effective way. You want to have the most time possible to address any potential potential issues that actually do arise in your case. Also dismiss immigration myths, dispel myths and misinformation about immigration laws and the immigration processes by seeking accurate information. I said this a second ago, use reliable sources and professionals. Don't believe rumors or rely on information from unqualified sources. Um, don't delay in seeking legal assistance. If you haven't retained an attorney yet, but you have an immigration problem, don't delay. Reach out to one or more qualified immigration lawyers. You can find them on the AILA lawyer search tool, um, which is an online uh, web page where you can find qualified immigration lawyers uh, who can provide guidance and representation when needed. Don't ignore important deadlines. A lot of these ignoring deadlines and missing deadlines in immigration can be really, really bad. It can be perhaps fatal to your case or at least can cause really significant complications. Don't become isolated, right? We just said it's a, it can be a lonely process. So participate in event in community events and seek support. Ensure all of your paperwork and information that you provide to your attorney is accurate and up to date. Uh, plan for the future. I mean, if you know that you know your time, let's say as a student, is going to come to an end, you're going to finish your academic program, let's say in a year or two years. You know, don't put off. You know, neglecting what the next step of your immigration journey is. Uh, have a long-term plan. Discuss with your immigration lawyer. And again, set realistic goals for your long-term immigration journey. And that includes planning for the expenses that you will incur in your case to move on to the next step of your immigration journey. And make sure that you stay in compliance with all uh, immigration laws and regulations, including and especially those around employment. Be aware and adhere to all of the rules regarding your particular, the, any work authorization that you have and any uh, laws and regulations that concern your ability to work in the United States because you want to avoid uh, inadvertently you know, violating status and causing potential issues that could impact your immigration status. Obviously, never, ever, ever use anyone else's documents. Jim, any thoughts on those uh, uh, resolutions? Good stuff. Okay. Well, uh, the last section is going to be New Year's resolutions for um, the agencies themselves. And this is a little bit tongue in cheek um, be, uh, because obviously the, the, the agencies, you know, they have uh, mandates that come down, you know, from the top that they then implement with the regulations. But um, aspirationally and semi tongue in cheek, let's talk about what we really think USCIS needs to do differently. Jim, what do you think? your greatest hit list of things that USCIS just needs to do differently in 2024. James, you'll recall this wonderful thing called InfoPass. InfoPass went away early in the Trump administration and hasn't come back. And so when you, on your list of things, you had increased transparency, it seems to me that a government agency should be approachable, should be able to talk to people about their situation. I think the Emma online portal is a joke. I think these tier one and tier two officers don't know anything. I think that's all by design 
So if I had one resolution for USCIS, it would be restart InfoPass and put someone in charge of speed at these cases. I, 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 either someone is not under no, someone has not undertaken the task of making things go faster at USCIS, or the things that they're doing aren't working. One or the two is true because processing times are actually getting worse. When I saw that the 751 extension letters were going to be 48 months, I was like, oh, no, that's we know why that is, because they're going to start taking 48 months to adjudicate these. Things. It's a total joke. So let's talk about the processing times, which are always, you know, where I, I guess they're never going to be great. But what do you think are the most egregious uh, processing times failures uh, nowadays that you're seeing? Work cards. It's, it's ridiculous. I mean, I know that they're going to start extending work cards for greater time periods. I think that's good. But I just think just generally, there's nobody there's nobody trying to make things go faster. There's nobody, I, I would say the worst ones are are the, the embassies are, are ridiculous when it comes to how quickly there's, you know, people are getting documentally qualified at the National Visa Center, and then it's a year before they get an interview. So it's ridiculous. So um, certainly processing times, um, my understanding is that the time frame for the asylum are set out very far. Um, we would also um, suggest uh, that uh, ICE really focus on prioritizing its enforcement, um, or, you know, on individuals posing genuine threats rather than low priority cases. Um, for EOIR, do everything possible to reduce the backlog, right? Improve, increase staffing, improve technology, explore the possibility of maybe AI to streamline adjudication. Uh, support efforts to improve access to legal representation for immigrants. Uh, support law school clinics and other efforts to improve pro bono uh, representation. For training for EOIR staff, provide training for immigration judges on trauma-informed adjudication to better understand the complexity of certain cases. Um, I can do a quick shout out to a, a very innovative uh, company called Communitology, which is a social science research sort of service uh, working on asylum cases. Uh, friend Sharon Abramowitz is the founder of that, and they are doing excellent work on uh, the need for uh, more training in terms of uh, trauma-informed adjudication and using vetted social science research in asylum efforts. Also strengthening language access, uh, access very important to ensure that individuals in proceedings with limited English proficiency can fully participate in the proceedings. Well, that's all of the New Year's resolutions we have time for today. I think we hit some great notes. Um, again, I want to thank Jim Hacking, uh, friend and excellent immigration attorney um, based in St. Louis for joining us today to help us with our New Year's resolutions. And again, to all of you, uh, from me and from DocketWise, I wish you uh, really success in 2024 and a new year filled with health and happiness. Jim, any parting thoughts? James, thanks for your time, man. This was great. I enjoyed spending time with you.